So chef and doctor, Lois Ellen Frank, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So we're going to talk about lots of things because you have a, an amazing bio, um, but let's, let's start with kind of who you are and what you do just to kind of frame the rest of the conversation. Okay. Uh, my name is Lois Ellen Frank and uh, I'm a Santa Fe, uh, New Mexico based chef. Uh, I have a catering company called Red Mesa Cuisine, where we specialize in indigenous cuisine and cultural education. My background is I am uh, Kiowa on my mom's side and Northern European. And on my dad's side, I'm Sephardic and Ashkenazi. So I grew up uh, sort of multi-ethnic, multi-lingual, multi-religion, multi-food customs, multi uh, a lot of things. I, I think uh, going into this, my mom always said that, you know, uh, she used the, the metaphor that we're all corn. And uh, on the medicine wheel, there are four colors of corn. And those four colors of corn represent the four directions, but they also represent uh, the four races of, of humans, earth people. And when you're more than one, you're still corn, you're just speckled. So she always told us we were uh, speckled corn, uh, you know, one of those beautiful varieties with lots of different colors uh, based on our background. So I think a lot of people can identify with that and being uh, speckled corn. <laughs> and uh, what else can I say? I um, love what I do. Uh, I am uh, very dedicated to promoting uh, Native American uh, cuisine and the history of Native American cuisine. Thus, I have a PhD in culinary anthropology with a dissertation focused specifically on Native American cuisine. I work uh, with Chef Walter Whitewater, who's from the Navajo Nation. Um, we're sort of the core of Red Mesa and we're very plant forward. Um, we are uh, not technically vegan. And the reason I'm not uh, completely plant-based is because in Native history, uh, if an animal was or is sacrificed uh, ceremonially for a ceremony or a feast or a gathering, then rather than not participate in that, I choose to participate in that for spiritual and ceremonial reasons. So the rest of the time I'm uh, focused on plants and healthy plants and, and plant-based eating, but there are situations throughout the year where uh, we need to participate uh, ceremonially and, and, and I do. Sure. So I'm curious, you said you grew up multilingual. Um, I did a bit of background research. It seems like there's only 20 or so native Kiowa speakers left. Did you learn some of the Kiowa? So actually, no, that's something that I'm really, really trying. I've joined a, a lot of uh, different groups, uh, Kiowa speaking groups, and I'm focused on that. My mom did not speak Kiowa, but my grandmother on my dad's side uh, spoke Ladino, and Ladino is a dialect uh, in Spanish uh, from the Sephardic Jews. And that language also is not spoken regularly, but uh, she did speak some of that. And so uh, I remember hearing things uh, in that dialect. Mm. So um, what made you interested in you know, that, that branch of corn in the, uh, the Native American part of your culture to go get, you know, study and become a, a PhD in and, and a practitioner and a, an ambassador for? Was, did you grow up eating those foods and on Long Island? So uh, I did grow up off a uh, reservation with my dad's side of the family. My dad uh, was first generation through Ellis Island. So he was born in Brooklyn. Both my grandparents immigrated on my dad's side through Ellis Island. And I think uh, one of the first things is, you know, we grew up on the North Shore of Long Island and we, I always felt somewhat out of place for lack of a better way to, to frame that. Uh, I knew from a very young age that I was interested in cooking and my mom always had a garden and my mom always brought in sort of an ideological thought process that everything is connected to everything else and that you can't 
do one thing or affect one thing without affecting the other. She was very open to me cooking and having uh, one or two friends over. Uh, I did this uh, in my last couple of years of high school of experimenting with cookbooks. I um, became uh, a vegetarian very early on in my career. I went to culinary school. The um, way that uh, culinary schools are structured is uh, if it's not perfect for the client that you're preparing it for, then you would toss it and recreate it. And that felt very wasteful to me. It, it didn't have that interconnected presence. So the other thing I was told in culinary school was that as a woman, I should go into pastry because women were not executive chefs. So I, this gives away my age, but in the 1980s, so after I graduated high school, uh, women had not really crossed what we call the culinary gender lines professionally. And if we look at the profession of cooking, it's uh, very Eurocentric based on a brigade and a guild system after a Scoffier in the early 1900s and men dominated these guilds. Mm -hmm. So women did not cross. But if we look at an ethnic kitchen, whether it's Jewish or native or Greek or Italian or Irish or any sort of denomination, uh, those are dominated by women. So women were always classified as cooks and men as chefs and sort of the profession of, of being a chef really was born uh, from the royal court really to feed royalty, right? So uh, the commoner did not have a chef. Uh, yeah. Chefs were used to, to feed uh, the royal court. So I, you know, it just didn't sit well. I left culinary school. I left uh, Long Island, the Hamptons where I was cooking and learning a very classical way, uh, sort of a, a very continental uh, cuisine, a lot of different ethnicities, but very Eurocentric. And I became a food photographer. My undergraduate degree is in, um, uh, I have a BA from Brooks Institute in photography. And again, what came naturally to me was to photograph food. I knew food, I knew how it oozed, I knew how it moved, I knew, I knew food. And so I could create a, a photo based on my culinary uh, sort of classic training experiences and then photograph that. So I did end up moving to Los Angeles and working with uh, two, uh, very famous food photographers, both men, and uh, helped run their studios. And then I uh, wanted to go out on my own. And, you know, the, the industry of food photography also is dominated by men. I didn't know this at the time. So but when women... You're, when just, you're a food photographer, what, like, how do you make a living? Is it just cookbooks or magazines or products? So that's what's another food? great question. The people that have money to pay uh, the food photographer, so editorial, cookbooks, magazines, pay very little, but they do beautiful. It's a beautiful showcase of images. Even to this day, I love to look at magazines and cookbooks because of the folk photography, but it's really the corporations. And so as I went out on my own and started to photograph these corporate accounts, I realized that and actually it was an elder that came to the studio and asked me if what I was doing was the poetry from within, which was a really ethical question. And I think I was early enough in my career to say that, no, I was promoting foods that I saw the unsustainability of and that I didn't per se eat uh, based on what I saw. And it raised ethical issues. Um, Do you have an example of a kind of food that you were thinking about? Like that so one? For, for instance, um, when we photographed pizzas, and this is pre-digital, in order to get that pull, that beautiful pull of the cheese sort of pulling, you have to make one pizza and then you pull it once, you photograph it, and then you need a new pizza because you can't do it again. It's already been cut and pulled. Uh -huh. So we would do sometimes anywhere from 
50 to almost 100 pizzas a day. And, um, uh, you know, I understand we're looking for something that some, uh, you know, marketing person thinks is perfect when actually food, I think now is the beauty in food is imperfection. But anyway, uh, the advertising industry strived for something that they considered perfection. And, you know, there were rules and product managers on site making sure that if uh, a pizza had whatever amount, ounces of cheese on it, that it, you really had to have that amount. Um, the truth in advertising law says that, you know, for instance, on a, on a taco, if it's three ounces of cheese, you can push the cheese to the front of the taco, you know, that three ounces, but uh, it has to really be what they say it is. If it's a, a specific brand of ice cream, it really has to be that ice cream, you know, so then we have to have the studio really cold and dry ice. And, you know, it's, it's very uh, laborious and very stressful, or at least it was in, in the early 1990s when I was doing this. And I think, what do we do with those pizzas after? I'm, you know, coming from this background of my mom saying everything's related. So my instinct is it should go to a, a shelter. It should feed people. Um, and uh, I think clients were afraid of, of, of liability issues. And, you know, I understand that from a client perspective. So I worked with other food photographers and lawyers, and we came up with a way to be able to donate these foods without uh, liability issues. Um, you know, if someone were to get sick at a shelter, they can't sue that client. And, and so the, the, the five gallon buckets of pancake mix or the hundred pizzas or the um, hundreds of pounds of chicken, whatever it was, um, got donated and fed to people. But, you know, the, back to that, is this the poetry from within? Um, I have to say that personally, when I looked inside the answer to this became no. And I knew I wanted to leave that industry and really work uh, back into a level with farms and farmers and promote sustainability and plants and educate. And so I left the advertising industry. I think my sales rep was probably, uh, I had a giant studio, you know, um, the biggest, uh, upset for lack of a better way to say it as were the assistants I were using but I moved to Santa Fe and I wasn't really sure how this was all going to blend or gel but I know I, I really wanted to focus on a, a smaller scale of quality versus quantity and and take a look at what we're doing and how we're doing it and support small farms and small farmers and and move more into sort of a plant forward way of being and how amazing plants are and what they do and what they mean in, in a native uh, ideological approach to native cuisine. And so that's actually gonna be my next book is eight plants that native people gave to the world and it's gonna be uh, completely plant-based. So I'm really excited about that. So I left that industry. Can I, can I um, go back for something because you said something. There's so many threads I want to follow. Um, you mentioned your mother said that like everything is connected, right. and I'm really curious how that was, um, you know, how that was shared and what like was you know sort of like in stories or lectures or like how she lived. Like what was, you know, because I I come from a, a an Ashkenazi Jewish background, so you know I get certain like lessons and morals from like the way my parents were and lived. And so I'm curious, like how that, how, how the, the indigenous wisdom got, got into you? Uh, that's a great question. I think my mom planted the seeds and then, um, you know, as kids, you know, as parents, you, you can't, you can only nurture your kids and then you have to sort of let them go at some point. And I'm very strong willed and I had dreams and, and, and visions for lack of a better way to say it from a very young child about plants and the earth and touching the earth and, and feeding and nurturing. And so my essence has always been that it, it, it's odd, but you know, from a very un 
uh, conscious young age, my sister and brother called me corn. And uh, that was originally what I wanted to study for my PhD. And I was sort of uh, laughed at, to be honest. And as I took corn as the base and then moved into Native American cuisine, corn is the essence of life, right? It has many layers. But my mom always, you know, it was, she, I was growing up during the time of, you know, Rachel Carson and the Silent Spring and this idea that if you do one thing, it affects something else. And my mom was composting back then, for lack of a better term. She just said, giving back to the earth, she had straw and we would move the straw and put these things in next to the plants and the plants would grow better. And I, I, I don't know if there was like a pivotal point. Um, I do know that you know, with the vegetables that my mom grew from our little garden um, at the end of the street. So we had another house. Uh, my dad loved the country. And so he bought this little tiny sort of house um, in what was called Remsenburg. So Remsenburg is between Eastport and West Hampton very early on. And we always went there weekends and summers and uh, I was a, a stable girl and learned about horses and they had gardens. And anyway, my mom had gardens at the end of our road, which was very rural, we would sell vegetables and some, you know, other kids were doing the same thing. The vegetables didn't move as quickly, but I did notice that if I made zucchini bread, for instance, out of the zucchini, instead of just piling up the zucchini on the table, that it sold much quicker than the raw zucchini. And so I must have been 10 or 11. What I realized at a very young age was that uh, this value added, if I added something to the plants, to the raw vegetables, I added value. And so I started selling my little breads at the local health food store on Main Street and at the end of the road. And I, I, I guess that was the pivotal point where I knew I wanted to cook and be a chef and feed people and work with locally grown produce and plants and make it into something that was not only nutritious, but that was delicious. And so the, my formulative years into high school and then uh, taking culinary classes and learning about uh, you know the culinary arts um, was this foundation, this idea. And I think my mom planted those seeds. I, I don't know if there's any specific wisdom exactly, just that she always said, you know, we, the earth is a circle. We all live on one earth. We're all connected. We're all earth people. We're all, you know, interrelated. We're speckled corn. And I guess that just stuck. Every, what we do affects everything. You can't do one thing and have it not affect everything. So you mentioned your age, and I think I'm, I'm sort of the second half of my 50s. And I also, you know, I grew up in North Jersey, which I think culturally, at least the Jewish part is pretty similar to North Shore of Long Island. And I remember at the, you know, the age of 12 and 13, going to all these bar and bat mitzvahs, and they had like, you know, parties for kids where like boys and girls would sort of flirt with each other. And the, one of the games we always played was Cowboys and Indians. And like you had to run, you know, they played the music and they'd stop and then you'd have to one, run over to one side, sit on someone's lap and then go, you know, ah. Oh. And I'm, I'm curious about. I never, what... never, ne never well, played that game. Uh, I, I know other kids, you know, that did. I, but what, I mean, what I, what I ask about in general is like growing up at that time, there was a stereotype of Indians that was very Hollywood, very exotic, very dismissive. And, and it was very prevalent, in, at least in my, you know, my middle-class Jewish upbringing. I'm curious how you saw yourself as a Native American, as an American, as a Long Islander, as a speckled Jew. Yeah, so, you know, identity is, is an interesting question and my mom, who was born in 1930, I don't think being Native was a popular thing to do during that period, uh, especially if you were mixed. But she always instilled in us uh, that 
all of our parts make a whole and you can't identify with one part without accepting all the parts. And so, you know, technically my mom did not convert to Judaism. So uh, in some circles, we are not considered Jewish, but we were raised celebrating the Jewish holidays. My dad's mother was kosher and kept a kosher kitchen. And uh, my mom's way of being was in all inclusive, all the parts of who you are make the whole. And you can't remove one part without it affecting all of it. And so for lack of a better way of, of, of saying that, she always said, this is who we are and this is our lineages and our, our, uh, uh, our parts. And what you do with that as a kid, I think, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think mostly uh, kids wanna be like other kids. You know, I can remember uh, the majority of the kids we grew up with were Irish Catholic or Italian Catholic and they all went to St. Mary's. We went to public school and I can remember going uh, to mass with them, not really understanding what that was, uh, nor, you know, accepting uh, communion. And they were like, what do you mean you haven't been baptized? And I was like, what, what is that? You know, in, in, we were, I, I, what, what do you mean? You know? And so you have to sort of educate yourself on, on what the rules are, what those rules mean. And, and some of those rules are not inclusive. Some of those rules are exclusive and you can't participate unless you've been initiated or uh, become a part of that way of being. And we, I didn't know that, um, you know, I didn't, we didn't even know what ice cream was until other kids are like, what do you mean you have an ice cream? And we thought yogurt cream was ice cream because my mom gave us yogurt cream, you know, thinking it was healthier than ice cream with less sugar. So, you know, there's a lot of different things um, that my mom did that probably wasn't normal or average. We had brown bread. I remember all the kids had wonder bread. We wanted wonder bread so badly. And oh. we, we had brown bread, you know, because brown bread had I, whole grains. I had peanut butter and jelly on caraway rye. I so wanted Wonder Bread. <laughs> so yeah, so you, I think as a kid, you just want to be like other kids, especially in an urban, you know, setting. It's not like a small community where pretty much everyone's alike. So there were lots of different influences and lots of different, you know, and I'll, I'll even tell you a funny story. So my grandma, uh, the Jewish grandma who, um, lived in Brooklyn and her neighborhood bordered an Italian neighborhood. But because she was kosher, we never questioned what she served or how she served it. And on some of the Jewish holidays, she served the marzipan cakes that were yellow, green and pink with dark chocolate. And when I was in high school, I went to the Feast of San Gennaro with some of my Italian friends and I saw the same cakes and I said, oh, you have the Jewish cakes. And they were like, these are not Jewish cakes. And I said, yes, they are. My grandma's Jewish and she serves those at the Jewish holidays. And they said, Lois, these are not Jewish cakes. And I said, yes, they are. And you know, we sort of left it at this disagreement. And then I went back to my grandma and I said, grandma, my Italian friends are serving your Jewish cakes. And she had this look. And she said, well, I, there is a bakery and it is Italian and they are not kosher, but they're pretty close. And so I was like, oh my gosh, my grandma was serving Italian cakes, you know, the marzipan. And so, you know, the traditions that we have in our family sometimes are not cultural traditions sometimes they're based out of necessity. And so my hypothesis, and I never really got to ask my grandma, was that she wanted something sweet. Maybe she couldn't get macaroons, although I do remember macaroons, but she found these marzipan cakes. They you know, were pretty close. It's pretty much marzipan with color and a little dark chocolate. There's no you know, dairy or anything. And so she served them 
but we never knew the tradition until we saw it somewhere else and asked her. Mm. Gotcha. Uh, so let's let's fast forward. You um, you moved. You, you you got tired of food photography for big corporations because it wasn't the poetry from within. Um, you then moved to Santa Fe. Yep. And so that's a whole that's a whole different uh, native set of native traditions, right? Yes, yeah, Santa Fe is interesting in that uh, in other parts of the country, you know, native people may not be prevalent. But in Santa Fe, there's this reverence and this respect. Uh, I think a lot of people come here to experience native culture and learn about a native way of being. And so it felt very um, comfortable to me to be able to be here and sort of celebrate. You know, they say there's tri-ethnicity here, but there's a lot more. The, the history is much more complex, but there are, are many native Pueblos and tribes, and they have a voice. And I missed that. I didn't see that on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. um, we did go to powwows growing up, but I, I didn't really see the same native voice that I saw here. And even in LA, there was a native community and I participated and went to a lot of the urban Indian things, but uh, I really felt the, uh, much more comfortable uh, in Santa Fe. Mm -hmm. So you said, was that the point at which you, um, you got your MA in cultural anthropology around corn? No, not exactly. Uh, I started doing, I started working at the Santa Fe School of Cooking and I started getting back into being a chef and doing private chef events. And we started getting so many requests that I wanted to, I, I'm a, a rule follower and I, I wanted to form a company and follow the guidelines and, and rules, you know, to make it safe for not only myself, but everyone I'm feeding. So uh, formed Red Mesa Cuisine, um, made an LLC, and then started to do different events, everything from very small to larger and travel. And I decided I wanted to do a cookbook on Native American cuisine was originally what I wanted to call it. When I went to New York to promote this, uh, the New York publishers told me two things. One, uh, that Native people didn't have a cuisine. And this wasn't the first time I had heard this. I had also heard this in, in culinary school that American cuisine was made up of all the contributions from all the immigrants and the Native voice was virtually absent, which didn't feel good. And that uh, the second thing the publishers told me was that with a BA in art, I didn't really have any credentials academically to discount this or prove them wrong. And I think whenever people have said stuff to me, I, I process it a little and it, it made sense. Those were valid comments. So how do you get credentials? Well, you go back to school, you get a master's and a PhD. And so I did. <laughs> and the title of my dissertation is The Discourse and Practice of Native American Cuisine, Native American Chefs, mostly male, and Native American Cooks, mostly female, in contemporary uh, Southwest kitchens. So Discourse and Practice of Native American Cuisine was this dissertation that I decided to do. And I worked with chefs all over the Southwest and, and events and documenting them and did a, a PhD, which I had bound and I still love to show and look at. And it took me much longer than I thought, but uh, it set me on a trajectory to where uh, I now do have um, somewhat of a, an authoritative voice and that's inclusive. I'm more of a conduit for uh, or a facilitator of, of what that means and then encouraging our native youth and other native chefs to uh, really uh, become so, involved in, in Native American cuisine and the culinary arts. Yeah, so help, help me understand this idea of cuisine because I, I live in America. So I grew up eating Italian food, Chinese, you know, Chinese food. Jewish food, American food, tacos, but it was all it was all packaged somehow. And 
I've never been part of a cuisine that was land-based where, you know, and I think like with, for, for indigenous peoples, there is a different connection to cuisine than I understand. Can, does that make any sense as a, as a question? Yeah, so, uh, and, uh, you know, I specifically use the word cuisine in my doctoral uh, research and dissertation because I think it's represented the finest of the food. So the Italians have a cuisine and the French have a cuisine, that thus the root of the word. But if you deconstruct cuisine, what it really means is foods from a specific region cooked on a regular basis. So it's fairly safe to say, let's take Italy, that Northern Italian cuisine is different than Sicilian or Southern Italian cuisine because they have different access to foods and regions within the context of a larger whole, right? If that makes sense to you. So when we start to look at place-based or land-based cuisines, then pretty much every culture in the world has a cuisine. I think what's happened over time is that they started to say, well, this cuisine is better than this. This is not really a cuisine based on a palate or a very Eurocentric way of looking at things. But if we take the actual meaning and deconstruct it, then native people have a cuisine, uh, Irish have a cuisine, the center will be different than the exterior, the access to seafood. Here in the United States, we have regional cuisines based on the immigrants and the native people that existed in those areas. And we can begin to make things a little more local and land-based focused than we can uh, a, a generic blanket. Uh, Mexico is another great example. Northern Mexican cuisine is much different than Oaxacan cuisine or the seafood cuisine of the Yucatan, much different. And so we start to regionalize. I think the idea, you know, the French might use the word to war, uh, you know, this idea that the food has the flavor of the land. Mm -hmm. But really, I think the way I try and define this is by calling it a foodscape. So a scape based like land on the foods that come in. And I mean, you, you said you're from New Jersey. So, you know, what is New Jersey famous for? It's tomatoes and it's corn, the sweet corn. And the reason it's so delicious there as is Long Island is because the glacier came through and dropped all these minerals into the soil. And when you grow things in that soil, you have flavor unlike anywhere else. Mm -hmm. It's delicious. And so, I, I guess what I started to do was try and define that, articulate that, and look at that in terms of how we look at cuisine and then Native American cuisine and then American cuisine and, and how all that fits. And even in China, you brought up Chinese food, the regions in China, the provinces have way different flavors. You know, we, we see only one generic blanket or umbrella of what that cuisine is here in the United States. Right. Of course, when we're talking about, you know, cuisine, we're talking about sustainability and culture, but also individual health. And what I've seen, um, in, you know, I'm, I'm now in North Carolina, so I'm in the, the American South, and the traditional cuisine of either white Southerners or black Southerners, five, three generations back was extremely healthy. Now the cuisine has been affected by both industrialization and poverty to the point where it's the cheapest stuff you can possibly get and the richest. So that what looks what people think of when they think of their traditional cuisine is essentially junk food or celebratory food now served on a regular basis. And I'm, I'm wondering, you know, how, how, how can we think about cuisine and, you know, whether there's purity in it 
when, when there's so many other forces that are acting on it, maybe in not such nice ways? So that's a loaded question. Um, I just finished a series of uh, five classes uh, with the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians and this idea of re-indigenizing uh, their foods, reclaiming, revitalizing their garden projects, the idea of what was foods of their ancestral past using TEK. So TEK stands for traditional ecological knowledge, knowledge based on the land of which they grew. So here we are back in uh, the Western part of North Carolina and some of the wonderful crops as well as the wild foods. And uh, their community is really doing major efforts to re-educate and re-indigenize their community uh, for health and wellness and, and reclaim this. You know, the uh, large food corporations would just to have you, uh, you, uh, you know, buy their products. And whenever I teach my indigenous food class, one of the questions for my students is, food companies are in the business for our well-being, true or false? And of course, you're laughing. Most people laugh, but some of my students actually get that wrong. And so, you know, the thought that if something's on the market, it must be good for you. And that's not necessarily true. So what I see is this movement to go back to very simple foods that are harvested and uh, wild gathered, you know, the, the branch lettuce, the, the ramps that are uh, probably still in season in North Carolina right now and how to harvest them sustainably and where to harvest them and how to use them and the wild strawberries and the pawpaw and you know some of these foods that can be cultivated uh the the black walnut you know so we really looked at all of these things and did education so not only cook-alongs but uh powerpoints on what these foods are to EBCI and how they can reclaim them for health and wellness. And I think, you know, all earth people can work with local foods and working, whether growing your own garden, which I promote, or working uh, on a local CSA or a local farmer's market to get healthy foods uh, into your diet. Um, and reclaim this idea for health and wellness. And many of the, the plants grow very well and very inexpensively. Um, instead of having a grass lawn, let's have an edible landscape. I have planted choke cherries in my front yard instead of uh, ornamental bushes that don't do anything. And every year I harvest anywhere from 20 to 35 pounds of choke cherries in my edible landscape that are in my front yard close to my house. So I think all of us can do this and the plants love it. And then I have other plants on the south side. I have wild currants that are just flowering. I have wild teas and medicinal plants. And so, you know, you, you take the landscape and see what grows naturally. And then you work with this idea of acceptance gardening you know, we, I, I cultivate as well, but accept what nature has and, and, and work with that bounty and, and use those plants as part of my diet. Mm, I love that phrase, acceptance gardening. Um, but, you know, at, at the same time, like uh, I've been to a couple of powwows and the food that's served there, you know, fry bread and lots of things and, you know, very greasy fatty, cheesy foods, it's, you know, it's, in, in some way, it's a little bit like your zucchini bread, like the zucchini bread, you added value, but you also added like sugar and flour and eggs and um, how, what, what, what's the message, you know, and this is like every, every cuisine, every culture is now having this problem of, you know, the hyper palatable foods have hijacked our, our taste buds. H how do you talk, you know, I know you're teaching native power plate, uh, foods to heal diabetes. It seems like there's there's a certain pride that you can um, you know draw upon. But like what, what's what's that like to teach you know 
um, native peoples that the foods that they think of as their traditional foods are maybe not the best for them? So I'm going to address the fry bread issue, which is its own issue. Uh, fry bread was born, so there are four distinct historic periods in native cuisine. The pre-contact, so the diet that existed before contact with Europeans. Uh, the first contact, foods that Europeans brought, and the biggest and most profound that Europeans brought here to the Americas uh, and introduced to native people were domesticated animals and their byproducts. So native people only hunted wild game and collected lots of plants and lots of nuts and lots of roots and lots of grains. And so they ate very little meat based on hunting and hunting only, uh, no dairy and lots of plants. So that was, was and is the pre-colonial indigenous diet. Then Europeans introduce sheep and pork and beef and goats and chickens and butter and cream and cheese and ice cream and yogurt and things that native people had never been exposed to. And that gets woven into uh, the fabric of Native American cuisine. We call that first contact. The same way native foods woven into European. So those are the magic eight, corn, bean, squash, chili, tomato, potato, vanilla, cacao, which didn't exist anywhere in the world outside of the Americas prior to 1492. So the Italian tomato, the Irish potato, the Russian potato, the British chips, uh, Asian chilies, French confection using vanilla and chocolate all come from native roots. So pre-contact, first contact. And then what we see is colonies. We see uh, English colonies here in the United States. We see native people displaced. We see industrialization. We see the railroad. We see the US government encouraging people to head westward. We see native land bases shrinking or being claimed by other ethnic groups. We see forced relocation. And during that forced relocation, the government issued rations to native people. And those rations included lard, flour, sugar, coffee, and the infamous canned meat, which we now know as spam or corned beef. And so native people had to make something to survive. And so fry bread is interesting in that it is a survival food and had the ancestors not made something in every culture has something fried. You know, uh, in Jewish tradition, there's latkes, right? So everything, something's fried in oil. Uh, we have donuts, we have, you know, different, those little balls that they serve at the, the different Italian feasts, you know, the, which powdered sugar on them. And, you know, and those are fine if you eat them once a year. But when you start to eat something every day, we do see uh, health disparities and we do see problems. And so this government issue period in Native history, in Native American cuisine, is where we start to see problems in health and wellness. And now well, we're in the fourth category. So what I call the new Native and the new Native American cuisine is really um, uh, a way for each community to define who they are in terms of their food and what they want to serve on their own plate. And there is no one plate that, like the government seems to think, you know, we have my plate. No, everybody's different and, and what they need to eat and what they need to, to eat for, for health and wellness and what's available locally in their area is going to differ. And so the new native is really this idea of going back to the ancestral past what was eaten and used for health and wellness? How do we create access to that now? How do we grow those crops like corn, beans, and squash, which are completely nutritious and completely delicious? You could almost survive on those three and those three alone. And what steps do we need to take to, to do this? And some native communities may choose to continue to have fry bread on their menu. Um, I certainly know how to cook it. Uh, I've been promoting something called no fry fry bread, where we take that same fry bread dough and we grill it either in a cast iron pan or over a, uh, a grill with a flame and eat it without frying it. And so, and without putting milk in it and without putting unhealthy ingredients in it by just using flour and then incorporating other things into it that are healthy like culinary ash or blue cornmeal 
And so there's this movement to re-indigenize and reclaim these essential foods for health and wellness. So we do still see the fry bread at the powwows, but I'm waiting for the, the food truck or the stalls that serve the healthy things, that serve the beautiful uh, quinoa stuffed chili uh, with local corn and some heirloom tomatoes um, instead of the, the fry bread. And, and, and we are moving, albeit slowly, uh, in that direction, you know, and as the whole United States struggles with type two diabetes and obesity and heart disease, we're all, regardless of ethnicity, going to have to shift to a healthy diet. We promote eat the rainbow. How do you eat the rainbow? Plants. We eat plants. So, so some, something that struck me linguistically is you know so you're you talk about food as medicine you have partnered with the physicians committee for responsible medicine you in your bio it says you're interested you're researching medicine medicinal and spiritual plants i know that the word medicine in native culture is is not just like a pill like there's a, it's a much bigger concept can you talk about that and how food as medicine would sounds to, to you know the the native part of your of your background compared to how it might sound to me I, I'm going to use another metaphor which is actually not a native metaphor I I, I don't know its exact roots but uh, the metaphor you are what you eat hmm. and I think a lot of the average American the average person understands this and we really, Historically, you know, there's no word in a lot of indigenous languages for organic. And there's no word for that because there was no reason to differentiate between organic and not organic. Why would you need a word to differentiate something that never was? So as we start to see uh, petroleum based chemicals and fertilizers and trying to increase production, you know, we lose that idea of permaculture and sustainability and how we feed ourselves and how we feed ourselves is that medicine. But I think the medicine in food goes much beyond just what we put into our bodies. I think it's how we live on this earth. And one of the things I said recently at a um, global uh, conference was, you know, when was the last time you took your shoes off and just touched the earth? Just stood on the ground without shoes on or concrete or a floor or sneakers or moccasins or when was the last time you just touched the earth? And one person said, oh, I went to the beach and I took my shoes off and I touched the sand. But everybody else was just stopped in their tracks. When was the last time you touched the grass or just felt the earth? I think, you know, this idea of grounding ourselves and reconnecting is also medicine and also a part of how we become healthy earth people. And so not only is it the food, and yes, if I can buy organic and afford organic, I, I do buy, but I can't always. Sometimes the difference between a non-organic blueberry and an organic blueberry is three or four dollars for that little container. And I do think about that. So, you know, what are the dirty dozen and what are the clean 13? And how can we eat and live within our means to be the healthiest that we can? And when I think about living in accordance with a way of being that's sustainable, that's what I think about. So yes, food is medicine, but the way we live is also a way of living healthy. And more and more health insurance companies and doctors and people, and I love working with, with Physicians Committee, I love PCRM, you know, because this idea that we can be healthy. And rather than have a prescription from a pharmacy with a pH, you can go to a FARM 
ACY and eat microgreens and local lettuce and tomatoes and foods that make you feel good. Food is our fuel. It should nurture us. We shouldn't feel tired like we want to lie down and go to sleep after. <laughs> we should feel energized. And so we all need to reprogram our brains and reprogram how we look at the way we live to reclaim, revitalize, and become healthy humans. It's beautiful. Um, what about the, uh, you mentioned the sort of the spiritual aspect of plants, whether whether foods or or other other ways of ingesting plants? Uh, how, how does that inform your work? So, you know, I, I have this little uh, shell and in the shell, I have either sage or sweet grass. Uh, I recently picked some juniper, a juniper branch, which I let dry. And then, you know, I light that and I use that, that smoke to help my thoughts travel upward into a, a higher plane, into a, 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 a prayer, into a way of manifesting, you know, a, a thought process. And I love to go out and talk to my plants. We have, uh, everything's just coming back to life. And so uh, I go out and I'm like, oh, look, you know, uh, you're coming back to life and, and then touch that or give it water or make a relationship with. And, you know, the same way we have families, we have brothers and sisters and parents and, and cousins and, and, and people in our lives that we respond to. Plants do the same thing and they respond to each other. They respond to being planted together. Many of them want to be planted together. They have families, they, re, they do very well. And so I really try and pay attention to that. And I was just looking, uh, we have a, a um, let's see what it was called, direct from the grower. So there's uh, a ethnobotanist that grows very water wise perennials. And so I went online and I started to look at what what do I want to incorporate this year? That's a perennial. So I love perennials because they come back to feed the hummingbirds, to feed the bees, to feed the birds, to make a relationship with the other plants. Maybe my chilies need pollination. And so if I have a salvia or a hummingbird plant, then they can make that relationship so that uh, or the bees to pollinate. And so again, you know, we go back to that idea that my mom instilled very young, everything is connected to everything else. And so I'm constantly looking at what can I plant to bring in more bees and hummingbirds, which are the pollinators, which then help the other plants that need pollination, which then I may use to harvest or eat uh, and um, connect the dots. Like, for instance, the choke cherries, they only like to grow on the north side of my house. The north side of my house is much cooler. It gets more shade. And I tried planting them on the south side and they, they, didn't, they didn't grow. They disappeared. And so they don't want to be on the south side. But some of my other plants, like the currants and the yucca and the globe mallow and the wild onions, they want to be on the south side. They don't want to be on the north side. It's too cold. Hmm. So we have to pay attention just the way, where do we want to live or how do we want to live? That plants are a part of this larger way of being and they have families and they want to grow and live in certain areas too with their relatives. And so I try and pay attention to that. Hmm. That's lovely. So, uh, so we're, we're, we're over time, so I don't want to keep you. Um, tell, tell a little bit about the new book. Ah, so the new book. So I'm very, very excited. Uh, we're looking at spring of 2023 and Hachette is my publisher and we're going to be focusing on uh, this idea of plants that Native people gave to the world and do some plant-based recipes that can be used many different ways that are delicious, nutritious, and I'm in the recipe testing process and I'm really, really excited. 
and uh, it's going to be good. So everything from, you know, uh, a bean and spinach taco to a, 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 a bean spread to uh, making a, a tamale instead of with a, a lard or, or, or a hydrogenated vegetable shortening using sweet potato. So we're, we're experimenting and bringing in a lot of these native foods for health and wellness. And uh, as a chef, it has to be delicious, but I also really wanna promote nutritious and make it easy. So for instance, if I do a refried bean recipe, I can use it as a side but then I can also roll it in a tortilla and make a red chili sauce or a green chili sauce and make enchiladas. And I can also use it as stuffing inside one of my tamales. So I, I really, this idea again, interconnected. If I make one thing, how can I use it in multiple ways that uh, add spice and flavor and uh, easy to do? So I'm really focusing on that. Okay, great. And for people who might live in your neck of the woods, you have a catering company, right? You, you... Yep, the catering company is called Red Mesa Cuisine. We have a Facebook page, we're on Instagram. We have a website, which we're constantly uh, working on. And uh, please follow us. I am on Twitter, although I'm still learning that. So that's my least, uh, I'm, I, I haven't done any tweets yet. I'm still learning. I. I'm not a millennial, but I, I am trying to learn uh, how to do all of these new things. So uh, you look for things. We're, we're definitely social media working in that direction and trying to uh, do some, you know, very short videos and, and posts as we go on this journey for this new cookbook. Great. And you have, there are some recipes uh, on, the, on the Red Mesa Cuisine website, right? Yes. So I'm just, uh, I'm pulling those up now. Just want to. It's two o'clock. It's, pa it's past my lunchtime. So this is probably yeah. a good time to look. Oh my goodness. P B Pinto bean and spinach tacos, corn tortillas. Yeah. And we've done, you know, uh, Chef Walter did a brochure with a PCRM and I did. So, you know, beautiful salads and microgreens and homemade tortillas and a beautiful wild rice saute and sweet potatoes with a little agave and lime and chili. And so very easy, but very delicious uh, food. So we're really moving and moving more in this idea of celebrating plants and plant forward and encouraging people to do the same. Beautiful. My last question, I guess is, um, you know, there's so, um, it's so clear when you are land-based, when you have a landscape or a foodscape, um, which I guess, you know, to me is like the definition of indigenous. It's like you are part of a community that, that sustains itself off of a land base. Um, you know, the, I was reading about the, the Kiowa, is that how you pronounce uh, they Kiowa? Were, they were, Kiowa, they were in the Rockies. They got relocated to Eastern uh, Oklahoma. All, most, you know, European, just descendants of Europeans are not on there. Like, do you see a way in which in Native American indigenous culture can kind of inspire or teach the, you know, the rest of us to become more indigenous? Like, is that a possibility? Is that a thing? So uh, we are all indigenous people. Everybody's indigenous to somewhere. Everybody came from somewhere. We are all earth people. And I do believe that the TEK, the ancestral knowledge that uh, is the wisdom of, of ancestors in, in all of our cultures can help us to reclaim and re-indigenize and be good earth people. We only have one earth. We only have one turtle island. And so if we don't take care of it, it affects us all. Again, going back to that idea of a circle and all connected. And so this idea of living and being yeah, in, in a good place on this earth, I think is something that we all need to do, regardless of size or age or shape or ethnicity. I think all of us need to reclaim uh, the indigeneity of who we are, whether that's Eastern European or Northern European or Scandinavian or Native American or Italian or Irish or Jewish or Greek or whatever it is. And, and how did the ancestors live in a sustainable way? And, and how can we follow that? And here in the United States, you know, what can we do to live on this land in a sustainable way so that there is 
food and land and it's clean and it's safe for generations to come. And I think this is something everyone needs to do. And uh, I would encourage everyone to do. Let's, let's end there. That's a beautiful prayer and uh, an exhortation. So Lois, Ellen, Frank, thank you so much for everything you do. I can't wait to see this new book. Um, the website is redmesacuisine.com. Yep. And thank you so much for taking the time today. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Nice to meet you. And it's been a lot of fun. Cool. Take care. <laughs>